everybody, it's RN Rakesha coming to you today with a quick video on nursing assessment 101 the essentials. And what I like to tell my students is that everything rises and falls on assessment. So it's very important that as a nurse you get your assessment skills down pat. Now, if you have started nursing school, which this is probably going to be tailored to those that have already started nursing school, um, you already should know that assessment starts where? As soon as we lay our eyes on our patient, we start assessing. Um, um, that could be their gait, that could be their appearance, right? Um, are they sweaty? Are they red? Are they blue? Are they green tinged? Um, all those things are going to be some things that we get into with what they would call subjective and objective data. Okay. Everything, even at the CNA level, we talk about uh, subjective and objective data. I'm gonna raise this up a little bit, you all, as we start. I have to stand up. I'm a stand-up type of person, but just bear with me. Hopefully everybody's in, gonna enjoy this. I have been teaching nursing school for a while now. Um, I'm very excited to be doing more one-on-one -on -one tutoring and as well using my nursing knowledge that I have developed systems and tips for success to help fellow nursing students be successful not only on the HESI but on NCLEX as well as getting through nursing school. This is, can help you with getting through nursing school if you are in nursing assessment or if you want to do a quick review before NCLEX. Okay, so how I like to think about subjective data is that it's subject to change. Also, it's subjective to the patient, how the patient relays it. So this is something if the patient says, uh, I have chest pain. We also like to call objective stuff, it's stuff that we see as the observer, as the nurse, as the clinician. Objectives are stuff that's like an object. We can see it, we can touch it, we can smell it. Okay, we could say that, um, it's like in, the patient would say they have chest pain. We could say that they were sweating. How about they're sweating and they're also cold to touch? That's something real wrong when they're sweating and they're cold touch. So objective is what we call signs. Subjective is what we call what they would say are symptoms. So when you come into the doctor, a lot of times people thought they were just saying, oh, what are your signs and symptoms? There's a distinct difference in a symptom and a sign, okay? So you wanna know the difference. So let's start there. You're gonna know the difference between symptoms and signs, objective and subjective. Subjective is stuff that the patient will tell us. Um, I feel nauseous. We cannot see, touch, or smell nausea. However, let's go down to if I was a nurse and I'm reporting a symptom similar or a sign, I would say they were vomiting. I can see it. Sometimes you can smell it and you can touch it. It's a sign, okay? The next thing I want to talk about is, you know, using your what you have. Your tools are going to be your eyes, your ears, and all of that good stuff. So don't ever not use that, okay? So the first thing you got to definitely know, remember, is the difference between subjective and objective data. So I'll be going up and down sometimes, so y'all bear with me. Um, some other things we want to talk about is uh, different things that can help you as far as some frequently noted signs and symptoms. Um, we could say uh, bradycardia, constipation. Now, is constipation a sign or a symptom? I would say it's a symptom because the patient's gonna have to tell us they're constipated. But we also can say it's objective data and the fact that they haven't had a bowel movement in three to four days, okay? Fever, erythema, um, echomosis, 
uh, dyspnea, diarrhea, inflammation, jaundice, lethargy, nausea, orthopnea, pain, uh, pallor, pruritus. Now, pruritus is different than just itching now. Swallowing or sallow, a sallow look, I'm sorry. Vomiting, I already said that. Tachycardia, tachypnea, all those different things. So again, after those are just some common things that you will see. Now, not only do you use your body for assessment, ladies and gentlemen, but sometimes we use some tools, right? What we use this for? We want to test those reflexes. I'll try to hit my. There we go. I got a little bit of one. I think I'm trying to do it too. You might can't. I can usually could hit. Oh, there we go. Um, also, what about this? Our stethoscope, right? We're going to use our stethoscope definitely in assessment. We can also take, right? We're going to also take what? Bowel sounds, lung sounds. We can also palpate. You can use these for that too. You can also use this for that too. We're checking it. All right. Um, so the other thing is oscillation, palpitation, and inspection. So I went over inspection. Inspection starts when I weigh my eyes on that patient. I'm already going to be, you know, looking at them, looking at how they're talking to me. Are they winded? Are they gasping for air? Or are they, um, let's go back even to emotionally. Are they crying and you know wailing when I go in there? These are gonna be things that we assess and that we're gonna note that all will draw a story as to the picture we're trying to paint about our dearly beloved patient, okay? <laughs> That's Mr. Jones. Um, don't forget about percussion as well. Initiating that nurse and patient relationship starts at the moment you lay your eyes on them. You wanna be genuine in your approach. We go back to being empathetic. We go back to nonverbal and verbal communication. Are you walking in there like this? Are you throwing stuff? Are you looking like you don't want to be bothered? Are you looking distressed and disheveled? That's going to impose upon that uh, nurse-patient relationship, okay? We also know you want to look. The other part I want to talk about is not only on the interview, but going back to what data do you have in the medical records. Always look at charts and stuff before you go lay your eyes on a patient, even if this is an intake assessment, if they're coming from another skilled facility, if they're coming from a hospital post-surgery, all of these things are gonna help us paint the picture as to how to assess this patient and give them the type of nursing diagnoses because we're gonna, we're gonna conclude and draw diagnoses based off of what we assess, right? So that's why it's very fundamental that you know how to do a good assessment. So I'm gonna do, uh, something I'm gonna show you all and then I'll also go over it just to show you what I'm gonna be doing but this is what a nursing admission assessment will look like and I will make this available on my expertise TV um, channel and it's expertise tv.com backslash I am nursing success so I will also put the link um, below for you all to read this okay but one of the first things you want to talk about when you're admitted are how are they moving around? Are they ambulatory? Are they in a wheelchair, right? Um, do they have unsteady gait? Are they mobile? Are they contractured, right? All of those things are going to be stuff we want to know. What about orientation? When you get to being in critical care, sometimes you really will have a patient that's unconscious when they're on a vent. They're not going to be awake, alert, and oriented, okay? Do <laughs> That's the worst thing you could do, you guys. Make sure you assess your patients for yourself. My teacher taught me that as well. I um, can't remember who that was that taught me that. But she was like, don't listen to a report and what people tell you and go by that. Make your first initial rounds yourself. So as when I remember, I remember being a new nurse, I made that one of the, my points to make sure I was attempting to be good it was I'm gonna make sure I place my eyes on my patients. You know, perception is reality. If they're your patients, once you have assumed um, getting on board and you have taken, um, you clocked in and you have taken your patient load, you're responsible. The next thing you're gonna be talking about is you're gonna use your vital signs. 
you know that goes back to we're going to check blood pressure you need to know what's normal and not normal get you a good stethoscope a lot of people like Littman I had a Littman in school and I had a Littman as a new nurse I hadn't bought another one since because it went missing and I just didn't want to spend that much money over again. But I went into education as well, but I still have a good stethoscope. You want to have a good stethoscope. So temperature is going to do a lot for us. It's going to indicate if this person is normal, if there possibly is an infection, if there was fever or something like that. Also, if there was something where there could be some hypothermia going on, or maybe they're, um, they're having low blood sugar, cold and clammy, need some candy assessment put it all together synthesize critical thinking you guys can do this okay all right what about their eyes are they focused or the pupils dilated or they pinpoint this is going to tell us a lot maybe about drug use or other things as well but that is one big one that i used to see a lot in the er are they pinpoint um do they wear contacts do they wear glasses these are going to be things that you want to make sure you go over as well. Um, sorry, y'all. Where would we? But I've been wanting to really put this out because one of, I met a young lady today that had, uh, she was in assessment class, so I just really wanted to do a quick video. I'm trying not to go 15 minutes. But going over assessment, the essentials, trying to do an essentials video in 15 minutes can be a lot, but I'm going to give it the best shout I have. Um, ear, nose, and throat, are they coughing? Are they coughing up some type of sputum? Meaning, is it a productive cough, non-productive? Productive, something's coming out. Non-productive, nothing's coming out. Do we have good lung sounds as far as when we get ready to go into respiratory? I kind of got into that because of nose drainage of any type. You want to note that. Are they having any nosebleeds? Have they reported any nosebleeds? Assessment always goes back to subjective and objective. As I review the systems with my tools of tra my tray, my eyes, my and everything my ears as well as my stethoscope and my other tools that we may use I'm gonna also be using the patient and the patient's family can be a great resource as well especially if they're not cognizant or very in and out um, then we're gonna go to circulation of course circulation goes with blood pressure um, is there red is their heart rate regular uh, is it weak is it strong is it irregular you know those are gonna be some things we look for with this um, circulatory endocrine goes to maybe um, with diabetics making sure you check their blood glucose make sure you even ask are you diabetic sometimes you need to find that out because they won't report it to you um, the GI tract when was the last time when was your last bowel movement when was, it, was you having your last year didn't are you having any problems urinating any burning any discomfort any uh, smells odors anything not normal we want to know about Elimination, of course, I just went over that a little bit. Also, do they have a colostomy? Um, do they use laxatives? Do they use stool softeners? These are going to be some things that can help you put the picture together as a registered nurse. And you guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and share these videos. I am a nursing instructor. I have been teaching nursing for a while now, over five years. I've been a nurse for over 10 years. And nursing is my passion and to be able to help you all in any way that I can it's something that I'm really passionate about so make sure you share this video and tell your friends to like it um, neurological is there any concussions any paralysis any syncope syncope is fainting okay um, any dizziness reported um, any vertigo or, or any type um, headaches headaches are gonna be a big one with the neurological system um, as well as going to the skin, the turgor of the skin. You want to make sure you test that skin turgor over a thin bony prominence. I like to do the hands a lot in the elderly. Of course, this is going to be indicating to us if these per this person is dehydrated or things of that nature. Um, is it sweaty? Is it scaly? Is it dry? Um, is it moist? These are things you want to look for. As for what about scars, skin tears, sores, bed sores? Make sure you do a good head to toe skin assessment, okay? Musculoskeletal, um, are they reporting any pain, any stiffness, any joint stiffness, any inflammation? Um, is there any, are they able to bear weight in every um, extremity? And how's the mobility? Are there contractures? You wanna know these types of things. Uh, as well as with women, when was your last menstrual period, right? 
Any previous surgeries? What medicines do you take? You want to know that. Um, so these are going to be some important things. Don't forget the different levels of consciousness. You need to know about that. There's conscious, I'm aware, I'm awake, I'm alert. Confusion, I'm in and out. Um, a lot of times you'll see confusion at the first beginning stages of um, Alzheimer's and dementia. Also, lethargy, um, you know, you're lethargic. You hear it there. A lot of times I see lethargy with drug users. And now, I'm not trying to make this sound like a bad thing because sometimes now these are going to be people who may be using oxycodone, Percocet, Xanax. You see a lot of lethargy with um, people that may be taking too much and not knowingly all the time. So let's just keep that in mind. Um, delirium. There, this is sometimes also something that could be um, initiated or brought on by drug use. But a lot of times people are delirious because of different types of things. When your electrolytes are off balance, you can be delirious. Too much of um, too much potassium, too much magnesium, any of those too much, not enough sodium. You're confused. You delirious. I'm out of it. Um, then there's the different levels of coma. Um, with the coma stage one, they call it stupor. Only I can only arouse you when I shake you. Hey, hey, you might wake up but you could quickly go back down. Um, stage two is a light coma. Um, if I were to pinch them, they only go, mm, mm. You know, they're not very responsive to painful stimuli. Um, then there's a deep coma. There's also deseverate, uh, deseverate posturing, um, meaning the extension of the body and limbs and pronation of the arms, um, meaning kind of they're flexed in, deseverate. Um, they're really deep into the coma. And then there's stage four, their flaccid muscles, apneic. Most of the time they're on a ventilator. Um, very, sometimes we may get some deep tendon reflexes if we knock that knee or something like that. But this is the level of they're pretty unresponsive. Then we go from stage four to what they would call brain dead. And a lot of times we believe people on a ventilator because they believe that they're going to come back. Um, but at a certain point, I think after 10 minutes of no oxygen, you are brain dead. And that and that your brain cells start to lose um, capacity, I want to say at two to four minutes of no oxygen. Syncope would be um, temporary loss of consciousness. Fugue state means dysfunction of consciousness. That could be hours or days. Um, and they don't remember things that maybe they do afterwards. Like they don't remember what happened yesterday. Um, they just completely blanked out in that moment. And then amnesia, we call that a contemporary loss of memory. Don't forget about lung sounds and how to oscillate the lung sounds. You're gonna wanna get good at that. Going on to oscillating the bowel sounds, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, also right lower quadrant um, and your left lower quadrant. After you do it all that, remember it's an order. You expect, also take, and then we're going to go to palpate. And then usually I use my uh, thumb to kind of do a palpate over our stomach. And you will do these in checkoffs. So take it seriously when you get ready to do that. So again, some key points. Remember to document everything. Take a little notepad with you. That will be very good. I kept one in my pocket. A nice little notepad. Um, I even saw recently they have some gloves that you can get that has all like the pulse, the temperature, and all that on the back. I thought that was really cool. Um, remember that everything rises and falls on um, good assessment because I feel like if it takes a dang on good nurse to be in a good assessment, a good assessment, because anybody can miss something. I've seen people miss wounds because they didn't really want to look at the butt. They didn't want to take that sock off and look at the bottom of that foot. I've seen breakdown missed. I've seen bruises missed. Um, and I've missed some things when I've been um, in a rush. You know, so don't be in a rush, especially on your initial assessments. Not really anytime. You want to do a good, thorough assessment, um, even from day to day. I, I know a lot of people work 12-hour shifts. I was just here yesterday. Yeah, but stuff changes. And you don't know what happened on this shift overnight. And sometimes people forget things to tell you. Um, don't forget to do some NCLEX questions. We're talking about edema in the different stages. Pitting edema, plus one, plus two. Go over those things. 
Um, remember, go from in a head to toe type of system. Um, try to keep a system to what you do. And don't forget that, you know, once you've done that, you want to go on and give your report also to the doctor and start conducting and concluding with your nursing diagnoses. Again, this is a quick, quick as I possibly can, try to hit you all with um, the essentials of a nursing assessment. I will maybe go more in detail with um, another video. Like, subscribe, tell your friends about this. Follow me on Instagram at I am nursing success. If you want to be a nursing success, I can help you get there. Again, this is Rakesha Clark, RN, MSN, coming to you from my office. Please like and subscribe. Thank you, rnrakesha.com.